For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Christoph Nerink. He's the Chief Marketing Officer, Global Brands at Walgreens Boots Alliance. On the show today, we talk about how Walgreens Boots Alliance is responding to COVID-19. We also talk about Christoph's portfolio of brands that he manages, both store or owned brands, as well as their global CPG portfolio. And we talk about the entry differences for market to market, uh, where there may be a leader position in the UK and how they've entered the US market or the Chinese market in most recent history. Then we switch gears and talk a little bit about his uh, personal background and uh, career trajectory and, and twist and turns and a moment in time, actually, uh, that you'll hear soon enough that defined his career and trajectory set forward. We also talk about uh, his love of plants and uh, <laughs> I'll leave it to him, but uh, it, it's one of the most impactful purchases he's made in the, in the recent history. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Christoph. Well, Christoph, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I thought it would be interesting to start with where you grew up. Everyone can probably hear a slight accent. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So maybe we could start there. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. I mean, I actually grew up in, in Ghent in Belgium, which, uh, you know, in Belgian standards is a big city. It's kind of the, third, the second biggest city uh, in, in Belgium, third biggest city, actually. But, but it's only 250,000 people. In the Middle Ages, though, it was the second biggest city in Europe, but it went a bit downhill since then. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Middle Ages. Yeah, that's our claim to fame. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. I love that because in the U.S., we're such a young country. Uh, I think all all Europeans look at us and go, "Oh, those are just <laughs> little babies." You know, <laughs> your history goes all the way back to the Middle Ages. Yeah, and actually, I mean, my mother tongue is actually Dutch, so so that's uh, where the funny accent comes from. Although I haven't lived in in Belgium probably for the now what 15 16 years now so well from ghent to uh walgreens boots alliance what's been your uh your career path if you won't mind yeah i mean maybe let me start off with the start which is i'm actually even though i'm a cmo i'm, I'm not even marketing trained i'm actually an electronics engineer uh so uh but but i kind of realized towards the end of my studies that's not necessarily what i wanted to do i work on microchips etc so i actually uh, straight out of uni i, I started at png in, in belgium that was and at png at the time they didn't tell you which brands you were going to get so it was kind of the oscar ceremony on my first day and i got always all day stamp packs which um you know truth be told <laughs> were not necessarily the dream brand i wasn't necessarily hoping to sell tampons but there you go but in the end uh, i ended up spending five years in that category actually uh, two years in belgium and then i moved to the, the Western Europe headquarters in Geneva, where I spent another three years on femcare. And the reason why is actually it's one of those categories where you make a meaningful difference in women's lives because, you know, you allow them to get on with their life, whether they're on their period or not. So, so that's why, even though initially my reaction was like, hmm, not quite sure, actually, I quite enjoyed working on, on feminine care category, as PNG calls it. And then after five years of glamorous sanitary towels and tampons, I basically moved on to an equally glamorous category, uh, being uh, laundry detergents, where I spent another five years. And, uh, you know, I started off on, on brands like Bold and Lenore, and then basically got the keys to the castle as I basically led as a, as a marketing director, Aerial Western Europe, which for the people in the US, it's like Tide US. So this is a, a massive business for P&G. So that was a, a really exciting assignment, uh, being able to lead such a brand. And so that, that brought me to nearly 10, 10 years at PNG and, and at that point in time I was like I'm ready for something else and something different because I would say these first nine years probably conclude the first stage of my career which is you know engineer becomes marketeer I think stage two was just learning new skill sets and, and stage two the first stage I went for was actually I went from you know, sanitary towels and tampons to Gucci beauty you know luxury beauty which was super interesting for a number of reasons first of all until then I had only led Western Europe 
you know, and all of those diverse markets within Western Europe. But then it was a true global business where, you know, I now also had US, Asia, Middle East, Latin America. So all very, very different. So that was the first bit. The second bit was the business model because you're in luxury beauty, which means you have counter business, etc. So it's not the usual CPG bit. And I, I would say within that, it's it's a licensed business. So because P&G had the license, uh, on those products from the Gucci Fashion House, so it's it's a super exciting dynamic because in the end you don't you don't have many decision rights. You only have uh, influences, skills <laughs> to use to convince a sometimes not that rational Italian fashion house that what you're proposing actually the right thing to do because PNG is super rational, and then of course an Italian fashion house, whilst of course they know what they're doing in luxury fashion, uh, might not always respond to the same rational arguments a PNG or would. So that was was super interesting. I was just going to say, that's quite the transitions, it just within p and I mean, within one company. Uh, yeah, that was an amazing opportunity, frankly, because, you know, I had done core brands, core businesses, and it doesn't get much more core than p gs laundry business and their flagship brand. And then within p g to have that opportunity to actually uh, work on, on such an amazing icon like the Gucci brand and, and actually work you know, and meet with the fashion house on a weekly basis to design and create new products, advertising, new in-store furniture, all of that stuff is, is super, super interesting. Well, and then what, what was the impetus that brought you to uh, Walgreens Boots? Yeah, I mean, there was a, a personal and a business uh, element to that. I think, you know, on a personal level, my partner was moving to London and within P&G, there wasn't necessarily the right opportunities for me. It also coincided with a time when actually Coty took over with mixed success, one might argue, the, the P&G prestige business. So I felt it was just the right time to move on. And, and as I was moving on, I was carefully looking at what do I I want in line with because this is probably then the third stage in my career where I, I wanted another completely different skill set is uh, you know how about going to a company that is both a retailer and a CPG and that's what Walgreens Boots Alliance is I mean they're one of the world's largest if not the world's largest you know pharmacy chain group whilst at the same time we have our own brands that live within our own retail footprint but also outside and that creates a whole heap of opportunities that you wouldn't have at a CPG so so that was super interesting and I, I spent two years there first leading their skincare portfolio and then now uh, more recently or two and a half years ago, took over the CMO role, leading all of the brand portfolio. And that's both our brands that I would call our CPG brands that live out and inside of our own retail footprint, as well as our own brand business, which uh, you know, private label one would call it, that is Boots and Walgreens brand that, that stands on our own shelves. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we're living in this very unique time. Uh, talk about, we may have to go back to the Middle Ages to have had a global pandemic at this point with COVID-19. And I'm just curious, I mean, it, it has to throw many wrinkles into business. We're probably both actually sitting at home doing this recording um, at, for one as one example, but just curious how you, maybe yourself and, and Walgreens Boots Alliance have been responding during the crisis. Yeah, and, and definitely, I mean, unprecedented is definitely the word that comes to mind. I mean, who knew uh, that, you know, what started off in, in, in a little market in uh, Wuhan <laughs> uh, would have created this, right? Um, so, and indeed, I am sitting at home. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have been for the past three and a half weeks, and it, it looks like there's a few more weeks to come. But, you know, and, and, and I must say, I mean, within these unprecedented times, I'm quite proud, actually, to work for a company like Walgreens Boots Alliance, because that's when, uh, you know, the purpose of our, of our business in terms of helping people across the world lead healthier and happier lives has never come truer, because, you know, our pharmacists are on the front line of this crisis. We are actually also one of the world's largest uh, pharmaceutical wholesale companies as part of this group, uh, the Alliance Healthcare part of the business, they're keeping pharmacies worldwide in stock of essential medication, PPE, all of that stuff. So, and at the same time, we're having drive-through COVID test centers on our premises, both in the US and in the UK. So, so again, some amazing work that is happening by our colleagues worldwide. So it definitely, uh, in a time like this, uh, a company like ours can, can truly live its purpose uh, in a way. But of course, I mean, uh, this not to say, you know, with all of the social distancing measures, etc. clearly business is tough in these times. And to that extent, if I speak more to my own uh, side of the business, I think, you know, what, what we've done is, is probably you can categorize 
growth at almost in three phases. I think the first phase is make sure that your employees are healthy, are safe, and are all set up to do their job. And, you know, that in the middle of, you know, having to do homeschooling and having the IT infrastructure set up, you know, get on Microsoft Teams and, and all of those tools, as well as, you know, we, we have our own in-house content studio. Well, the studio is closed, right? So how do you stay, still create high quality content whilst people are at home? And, and you know, there's a, there's a number of really good IT solutions, et cetera, that we found for that. But, you know, that's probably phase one, which is, you know, try to grapple with the new, new, the new world. The second phase for us was, I would combine it as, you know, do, don't do any stupid stuff and do good. Uh, and, and with that, I mean, at this time, you shouldn't be spending mass marketing money because if stores are closed etc that's just a waste of money so you know it's about pulling back on spend that in the current context wouldn't be relevant but equally then adjust your messaging your style your content to the new reality show compassion show consideration but equally do some good like for example we have several csr partnerships we donated about two hundred thousand products here in the uk to the hygiene bank and to the nhs workers that are on the front line to really help the vulnerable and the people who are on the front line. And I think it's it's important that we do that. You know, we're also sourcing over 400 million pieces of masks and, you know, for, for all kinds of uh, purposes, hand sanitizer. I mean, you just crank that up. And, and luckily we have a good sourcing office in China uh, and in Asia that helps us with that. And that's probably phase two, which is don't do any stupid stuff and do some good stuff. Show that you as a brand care and contribute to society. And then phase three is you need to drive some growth because as a brand, you're not going to survive on, in step one and two. So you need to make sure that your digital plans are stronger because with the shift to online, make sure that you, you you do a lot of performance marketing, you potentially expand your digital footprint. If you're in beauty, you probably need some tools with which people can try on products in a virtual way when they're sat at home rather than in a store, uh, you know, creating products that are more relevant because this situation is here to stay. If you think about immunity, sanitization, protective equipment, masks, you know, what, what are brands going to do in that space and where, uh, particularly in my portfolio, clearly, which is a combination of beauty and healthcare and wellness. These are uh, times when we need to make sure that we bring the relevant products to the market. So I guess that's, that's probably the three stages that that we're going through as a business. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, you know, the you mentioned, you know, your your scope if you will is the the CPG brands as well as the owned and private brands if you will portfolio. How do you think about managing those cuz they're very different but similar. It's it's very it's a unique construct having brands that can stand on themselves, stand on their own even maybe in sometimes outside your own channels. And then having, you know, the, the typical store brands on shelf as well. Exactly. I, it is. And I think, you know, if, and that's why indeed it's the right way of looking at it and splitting that portfolio in two in the sense that you have the CPG brands. And, and there's one unique feature that we have as a retailer, or being both a CPG and a retailer, is that we have lots of customer data from our loyalty programs. If you think about the, the Boots at Cart program or the, the Walgreens Balance Reward, if you add those two together, you have more members than, than Amazon Prime. So, so it's, it's, a huge wealth of, of information that we have and so and the insights we get out of that help us not just on the brand and product creation side but it helps us also really on the marketing side because then you can make sure that you you can use that first party data which other cpgs don't have because they don't have a big DTC business. But that's where, uh, you know, leveraging that gives you unprecedented opportunities. And and we truly built a strong brand portfolio on that CPG side, you know, where we have uh, lots of insights. And, you know, we have number seven, which is a, an amazing anti-aging brand, actually number one in the UK and, and uh, you know, during uh, certain periods in the US, running up to number three and four in skincare, anti-aging skincare. Beyond that, we, we have Lizeral, which we acquired, which was a premium naturals brand. We have Botanics, which is a mass naturals brand. We have Soap and Glory, 
uh, which is a, an incredible personality brand in beauty, uh, sorry, in personal care. We have Sleek that is all about an East London born brand, which is all about high impact, high color payoff and pigmentation in, in cosmetics. We have Your Good Skin, which is in the healthy skin territory. So we built up, because when I started in this business, we pretty much had one brand, one country. And, and the, the mission was build this out to a relevant brand portfolio, which is the portfolio that I just mentioned, and then turn this into a formidable global CPG business. And because we have all of that richness in, in first party data, that gives us a lot of insight that probably other CPG companies don't have or have very uh, have many difficulties in accessing those. Yeah, I may have just one additional like practical question here, because I'm just curious how, how you manage it. You've got the store brands, uh, you know, probably the Boots and the Walgreens branded merchandise. And those are, I'm assuming, confined to your store footprint retail locations. And then you've got the brands that may sit across those, frankly, and may, and then you have brands that may even extend beyond that. Do you structure your team in that manner? I'm just curious how you, the people management side of it, if you will. No, you're right. I, I think, you know, and... And it also depends geographically, but indeed I do have what I would call the own brand team. And then we have the beauty team, which is those beauty brands that I've just mentioned. But but even geographically, you know, you, you think about, to your point, you need to make some decisions on where you go outside of your own footprint and where you don't. And, you know, the, the, the logic, the simple logic there is, you know, if, if our own retailer has a big share of a market, like for example, beauty, and we have a strong brand like number seven, Actually, it makes more sense to keep that brand in our own retailer because it's a footfall driver and that external footprint is probably more limited. Whilst um, when you your own retailer has potentially a smaller uh, share in beauty, then probably you bring it outside of uh, your own uh, retail footprint. Uh, and that's what, for example, is the case in the US where we are so sold in Target, Ulta, and as well as Walgreens, of course. So, so that's where, and even a DTC there, we have as well, uh, directtoconsumerwebsite.com, number7beauty.com that we have in the US as well. Got it. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about number seven because it is beloved in the UK. And like you said, it's maybe exclusively in boot stores. And you're selling this in the US and Walgreens, like you said, with Target, Ulta, and then your D2C presence. I'm just curious, managing this in two very different markets, two very different, I'm assuming, like market penetrations at this point. What are the big differences as you look at the two different markets, just the US and the UK? And, and curious about your perspectives on D2C as well. Yeah, no, and, and clearly there is differences. I mean, uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the, the seed concept where you see the brand and then, you know, you have that life stages of a brand. And, and clearly in the US, many of our brands are at an earlier stage or in particular in China as we've entered in China as well. But, you know, the I think... Ultimately, it's about finding the locally relevant insights as well as marketing mix. If you think about in the UK, we're operating, you know, TV, print, everything, all the way down to performance marketing, upper funnel, mid funnel, and lower funnel. Whilst when I look at, for example, how we built the brand in, in the US, if I think number seven, for example, originally uh, there was only, you know, online advertising. We did have some localized, what I call TV integrations, which is like programs like, you know, the doctors, et cetera, so in relevant programs that went about clinically, you know, that could have an angle into clinically proven skincare, which is what our skincare lines do on number seven. Basically that would, you would just integrate your product there and, you know, you have the doctors talk about <laughs> your product and how amazing it is. And that was the right marketing mix at the time. But then, you know, as the brand then grows and develops, uh, you know, we did a TV test first, then we did one way in like a region, then we built that out into a, a, a one month national TV test. And now we're doing more and more TV as the brand grows and grows. And I'm pleased to say that actually, when I joined, the brand was not even top 20 in the US, but by now that brand has become in moments in time when all the stars align, we're actually number three or four in skincare in the US, which is a, is a massive achievement for a brand that was not even in the top 20 four years ago. Wow, that's that's amazing. Congrats. That's that's, some, that's a great accomplishment. And especially as a new player, relatively new player coming into this market. Yeah, you asked about the DTC as well. Maybe I'll give a few words on that as well, because 
And clearly, you know, we were at Target, Ulta, Walgreens and their respective dot com. But I would say, you know, those dot coms are more about transaction. So they don't provide a very rich consumer journey, customer experience. And that's where that was probably the predominant reason for us to look at a DTC where you can offer a, a much richer consumer experience, more content, truly introduce the brand, its heritage, what makes it special. Whilst on the retailer website, you can't really do that. Now, we could have just gone for a content website, which is what many of our competitors do. But, you know, again, I, I mentioned this before as well, and we can talk about that a little bit later as well, but which is this whole element of data and the importance of data to improve the personalized experience of your consumers. That's why I think DTC is an absolutely crucial part of that mix and, and why we indeed launched DTC, even though I said we do have a Walgreens.com where we sell our product. Yeah. No, well let's let's talk about it because like you said, you've got this huge strategic advantage of having first party data um, in a CPG world where where you typically don't. And it seems kind of brilliant, frankly, to have the combination to be launching into a new market where you can leverage that first party data in your D2C environment. I guess, how do you think about capturing the, the opportunity that's there? Yeah, I think, I mean, and, and that's where, you know, when, when you think about a traditional CPG, of course, they get information of Facebook and, you know, what we call second party data and third party data. And so they try to target their media based on that. And clearly, that's effective to a certain level, you know, just putting that in that will definitely result in higher ROIs because you, you provide consumers with more relevant content at the right time uh, and in the right place. Uh, however, when you have first party data, that just takes it to a, a completely uh, different level because you actually, it's not just based on hypothetically what consumers are interested in, what they might do. It's actually, you know what they're doing, <laughs> you know what they're buying because you have that first party data. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to bring that to life with actually, I'll choose not to reveal too many trade secrets, but, you know, to I'll, I'll use an example of Netflix. Actually, it's a very similar example. And, you know, there was this Narcos, they were launching Narcos as a, as a show. And so what they did actually is, of course, they know what you're watching on their platform. And that's what I would call first party data. You know, they, you know, the type of show, they know the type of shows you're interested in and the current users of their platform. What they would then do is then, of course, all in a, you know, data compliant way, GDPR compliant way, they would pass those email addresses to a Facebook or an Instagram. And what they would ask Facebook and Instagram to look at, hey, we're launching a show called Narcos. We think these people would be interested in that. Can you find out what other things these people are interested in based on their Facebook likes, their Instagram behaviors, etc.? And then once you know that, can you find me the lookalike profiles of those people and multiply that? And then basically, you, then they know exactly what these people are interested in. And what they then did is they had little snippets of trailer of specific things, like, for example, if somebody is more interested in romantic scenes, they might show Pablo Escobar having a romance. Whilst, you know, if somebody's more, you know, interested in murder and whatever have you, they show a killing scene or whatever, something violent, uh, you know, and if somebody's interested in sports car, they show something sports car. If somebody's interested in vintage cars, they'd show vintage cars. And what a piece of artificial intelligence would then do is they would literally look at, okay, first party data, second party data, what do we know of this consumer? And then in real time, stitch together a trailer that is based on your interests and then serve that to you at the right time in the right place, which means that Netflix had running at any given point in time, 1.5 million different variations of their trailer that they were serving up based on that data. Now, if you don't have that first party data, you can't truly activate that whole ecosystem. You can only follow that through up to a certain level. That's the kind of stuff that we're doing at Walgreens Boots Alliance as well. When it comes to, you know, just to give a simple example, if somebody's not interested, doesn't have hemorrhoids, what's the point in advertising hemorrhoid cream to them, right. <laughs> you know, for example? Right. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. That's a phenomenal advantage that you have. Just the Netflix example alone is making my head hurt. 1.5 million variations of a trailer, but that's personalized marketing at mass. And that's where, you know, we've, we've run similar things for our flu campaigns because, you know, not everybody uh, has the same needs in that space because, you know, some people are more and, or have, have the same drivers of why they want it. If you have the flu, 
course, you have a certain need, but if you're a carer, it's maybe more about prevention of your elderly parents uh, getting the flu in the first place, you know, and, and so making sure that we know what people, what makes them think, are they a caregiver? Are they just a health conscious shopper? They want to go into prevention? Are they a value seeker, a convenience seeker? Then, you know, is there a local outbreak? Then we can actually say to people, hey, there's a local outbreak, you might want to get your flu shot. So it, it's it's really a personalized, personalized experience. And there's actually, these are not our data, but there's some, some industry data that shows that when you look at personalization, you see a massive uplift. Like there's some data that we got from our agency partner, WPP, that showed that, you know, Average order value goes up with 1.4 basket size times 2.1. And the net promoter score on the back of serving personalized content to your consumers actually goes up with 1.2. So those personalized experiences enabled by first party data are only going to become more and more important. And that's where we as a hybrid company between a retailer and a CPG have, I think, uh, an incredible advantage. Well, I've never, I've never thought about personalization. I don't know why I haven't ever thought about it this way, but it seems like what you're doing is just, it's personalization for sure, because it's tailored to the individual or at least their their interest that you can identify or, or understand from a signal of some sort. But it's really about delivering relevant content. And that makes perfect sense that you'd see some of those metrics go up because of relevancy for no other reason. I'd almost say good personalization is when you don't know that you're being personalized too, because, you know, it can get creepy, you know, when you on one device do a search on a trip to ibiza or wherever you're going and then all of a sudden in the middle of another device facebook feed you see that same thing cropping up that is a bit creepy because then like somebody's tracking my movements or you know even all of the rumors about is alexa listening or not all of those things but i think the best personalization is when it just feels like oh this is relevant it doesn't feel it's intruding on anything i love it i love it well let's switch gears slightly you mentioned china earlier you know launching into that market it's a very different geography and um just sure interested you know how, how do you think about geographic market differences especially at launch i'm uh, just curious what you how you approach it yeah i think it's a good question because i mean and particularly china is, is i mean many companies have tried and very few have succeeded one one would argue i think again it's about relevance right and 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 if i would say one thing is of course make sure your product is relevant and don't necessarily try to assume that there is a one size fit all you know if you, if you think about global brands like fanta or other brands they do tailor their product portfolio to the local needs you know fanta stays ever so slightly different in the us versus europe Europe versus Middle East for, you know, they just make sure that the product is locally relevant. So that's, of course, a must. And so that's the first thing to start off with. But then once you have that basic element and basic need covered, it's about how do you launch your brand in a, in a relevant way? And for example, in China, you wouldn't do that on TV or, or any of the techniques that we typically, you know, also for my CPG pass at PNG, you know, where you just massive distribution and then carpet bomb the market with mass advertising. That's not necessarily the right approach of entry. In China. And so, you know, in China, it's a very online driven and it's, it's they called KOLs, key opinion leaders, which is basically people call them influencers in, in the West. That is one of the key tools used to actually market in China. And so whilst, you know, in the UK, I'm more traditional full funnel marketing mix in the US, more digital with a bit of TV. Actually, in China, it's about 100% online KOLs. So Again, it's about getting that mix right and also getting the relevant content because if you don't know a brand, you probably want to see a bit of proof that this product is going to work. You know, in the UK, number seven is very well known for its clinically proven skincare. In China, it is not. <laughs> so we need to make sure that we get the right content then out there that, that you know proves to consumers that this brand has the right credentials behind it. Whilst in the UK, you know, we can almost take that for granted. So so it does need to be a different approach. And and it's it's worked quite well for us so far. You know, if I mean we've we've launched through cross border e-commerce to start off with so via Alibaba Timo. And in the first year of trading in 2018, they give these kind of rising star awards to brands that reach they have different levels of sales, you know, level one to 10, uh, where 10 is the highest. And so within the first year, we reached level five. There's only 12 out of a thousand brands that launched that year on Alibaba Tmall that reached that level. And so we, we were one out of the 12 that got awarded a rising star award. Uh, so again, it's, it's doing it right in, in the right way with the right marketing mix. 
of course, assuming your product is locally relevant. Right. No, that's awesome. I'm curious, not that you want to give away your secrets, but if you were advising you know, other marketers, maybe outside of your category to enter China, is there any any learnings that you've had you feel like are important to, to note? I mean, you, you've already hit, obviously, relevance for sure. But I think, I mean, and it's it's inter- I mean, China is light miles ahead in terms of online penetration. So you know, bricks and mortar can be a quite tough gig, and not just within beauty, but in any category. And it's quite fragmented still, etc. So my key advice is, you know, and particularly relevant in these times where even we in in the West are now, I think, making a, a leap f- uh, for a massive jump uh, into into online uh, sales. China's already there. Their online penetration in many categories is double of that in in the west so that's probably a top tip i would give to anybody yeah no that's great that's great well let's switch gears entirely one of the things i love to do on a on my show is to get to know the person behind the microphone so to speak and uh one of my favorite questions to ask is has there been an experience of your past that defines and makes up who you are today yeah, I think there. I mean, of course, you're you're made up by many experiences that make you into the person who you're now. But but it's since there's one that that sticks out, and that uh, it's more from a I would say a leadership belief. And this, I mean, I'll, I'll tell a little bit of a story around it. But I'm not a very big book reading person. Podcasts are way better, and I, I assume you agree. But uh, <laughs> the uh, yes. <laughs> yes, but uh, it was I was still a, ju- a very junior brand manager, and so I had lots of questions around my leadership, finding the right style that was authentic to me. And so, uh, and my boss had told me at the time, you know, you need to read this book. It was um, Stephen Covey from uh, Good to Great, and you know, I, I just don't read books. And so after the third time, he said, Christoph, I know you're not going to read this book, so I copied these 10 pages out of the book that are relevant so please read this <laughs> so he went very directive uh, but it, it talked about the level five leader and and the importance of of humble leadership and again they say it needs to be a com- they call it level five leadership which is about you know being humble and listen to the people around you whilst at the same time have a restless determination to make things happen and there's one example that really marked uh, me in that space um it was when I was uh, to even convince me that, that this was a leadership style I wanted to adopt, which is it was even before when my boss uh, forced me to read these 10 pages. It was actually an example uh, when I was only two and a half years uh, in PNG. I was, I think I had just been promoted to brand manager or as a senior assistant brand manager. And so I was working on a, a project called Always with Silk. And unfortunately, the global group president had just declared that she was going to can the project because she felt it was not right. Um, that woman was actually Melanie Healy, uh, president at the time at PNG, and she was actually in the fortunes uh, top 50 most powerful women in the US. And she was on number 13, actually. And so she canned my project. And so my, my VP at the time said, like, look, Christoph, I know you're brand manager. I was an assistant brand manager, actually. Yeah, because my brand manager was on holiday. My marketing director was on mat leave. So it was just me. And he said, <laughs> he said, look, I need you to fly with me to Rome. And we need to convince Mel, as we call her, that we need to keep this project. So there I was, uh, two and a half years in the company, in front of this woman that was number 13 on the Fortune Top 50, trying to convince her not to can my project. But then that meeting was the most amazing. Of course, I was super nervous. I came in with my slides and all of my fact books and all of that stuff. And I did my presentation and she was generous. She listened. She asked lots of questions. And at the end of the meeting, she said, all right, you've convinced me. Let's let's do this. And so she put the project back on the tracks. And even a year later, we won the PNG Global Brand Building Award. And I'm sure behind the scenes, uh, she was the one pushing it. But, you know, she could have easily said, I'm not even going to bother, just can it. But, you know, her generosity, her listening, it just made me feel like a million dollars. And, and that's how I feel. I want to be with people. Uh, and, and so that was very inspiring to me, the way the way she did that. Yeah, no, that's a that's a beautiful example of great leadership. And for you, I mean, take about the uh, the initiative, given that you got to fight for the brand in spite of not having your, your management team around as well. That's phenomenal. And I do want to, you said good to great. And I think 
you mentioned Stephen Covey, but it's James Collins is the author. I is think. it? There you go. You see, I didn't yeah, read yeah. it. I didn't lie. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I just want for, for those listening, I didn't want them to be like, wait, a, wait a second. What, what, what are we talking about? So yeah, is James Collins. But we'll link we'll link to it in the show notes for sure for for those that want to check it out. And maybe maybe yeah, the, he didn't the, copy uh, the, the front page team. of the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, no, no worries, no worries. Well. Just curious. I mean, that was a phenomenal experience in early career. So I'm really interested to ask you this next question is, what would you have told your younger self if you're starting all over again? <laughs> I think the big thing, and you know, I, I did sometimes and sometimes I didn't do it, but it's uh, the big thing for me would be swing big. You need to set yourself audacious goals and then go for it. I mean, I think it was Leo Burnett, but you might correct me again, uh, who had this saying that said, you know, if you reach for the stars, you won't end up with a handful of mud. And I think it was, it's super important to set those audacious goals because when you do, I think the universe then magically conspires to make it happen somehow, <laughs> you know, but if you don't have that and this is, and you know, for every important moment or every th- important thing in life, there's a Monty Python clip. But there's this one clip of Monty Python. I think it's called uh, the Olympics uh, for running for people with no sense of direction. I think is is the, is the title of the clip. You might Google it. But basically, so you see all of those people on the starting line, all of those runners, and then the gun goes off, and then they run in all different directions. And that's that's the point. If if you don't know where you're going, and you make that a big hairy goal then one, you won't get there very fast. And two, you won't achieve much. And, and I think, you know, for me, that swinging big and that setting those audacious goals and then go for it, I think is is the most important thing that I think anybody can do to also just get some satisfaction out of your job. Great advice, great advice. And I, I keep, I'm waiting for the book that is titled Everything I Needed to Know in Life I Learned from Monty Python. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a silly question, but one that I've, I've started adding to the mix uh, for, for guests like yourself is um, curious if there's been an impactful purchase that you would like to share with us of say $100 or less in the last six to 12 months <laughs> that's that's really helped you out. Right, more recently, probably face masks, hand, san- hand sanitizer and vitamins were probably the most impactful impact, uh, low cost uh, you know, product. I think, you know, beyond that, I, I think it's gonna sound very silly, but I, I bought these plants, uh, they're called uh, mother-in-law tongues, but I just I just love them. And on top, I mean, they're, they're plants that the NASA is gonna to take to Mars. So I thought, you know, if the NASA is gonna take them to Mars, they're good enough for me. But basically, there are plants that get lots of, I live in the city center, so they get uh, they break down all kinds of bad stuff, and they actually give oxygen day and night, and and so, which is quite unusual for a plant, because usually plants give CO2. Uh, I know it's not necessarily in the branded space, but I actually have 40 of those plants. <laughs> they line my whole flat, so uh, one could argue I've gone overboard a little bit. But anyway, so. <laughs> I love it. I need to check that out, especially, you know, when we're working from home, having a little extra oxygen i get a lot of comments yeah, exactly and i get a lot of comments on my plans because they're behind me <laughs> when i'm when i uh, video call nice 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 well um two marketing ish questions for you if you kind of step back from the day job and all the great brands that you're managing yourself i'm curious if there are brands or companies or causes that you are following or, or taking notice of you think other people should should notice as well yeah there's many uh, of course that are doing uh, great stuff i think there's one that i probably it is in uh, beauty, but that I want to call out because nobody saw that one coming. It's Rodan and Fields. Basically, you know, six years, uh, a little below over six years ago, they were $24 million in turnover. And then six years later, they were $1 billion. Uh, you know, and not through a massive, you know, of course, when you have Kylie Jenner doing her cosmetics line and all of that stuff, you know, I get it why, why that stuff takes off. But basically, they built out of their backyard if you want a massive skincare brand actually in 2017 it became the number one skincare brand in the u.s nobody saw that coming and and the way they did it is is even more amazing right they did it through a completely new business model uh, they did it through social selling which is basically like tupperware parties but online you know on facebook and they built that out of nowhere and I, but it, it is it is quite an, an impressive way how through of course great product great credentials but then a completely new business model 
they've completely disrupted the market. And I think sometimes when, when we do product, I think we should start with what's the business model before we go even into, oh, we have this product idea. I think, you know, uh, for me, that they're a great example of that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good example. Well, last question for you. Curious what you feel like is either the largest opportunity or the biggest threat ahead for marketers today. Yeah, for me, they're they're both probably the on a different flip side of the coin. But you know, it's it's quite for me. It's around you know, as a marketeer, you need to stay relevant, and the only way you're going to stay relevant in the current times is if you drive growth. You know, as a marketeer, you can't just be the pretty pictures department. Uh, you need to drive growth, and you need to be seen as an engine for growth. Because I think I saw some stats recently that says uh, that thirty percent of CMOs only stay in their job for less than twelve months. Like the average CMO tenure is like 27 months or something like that. So as and and there was another side, I believe that 50% of CEOs think that CEO, their CMO is effective. I mean, one in two think their CMO is a bit useless. So that's where you know, and and being that engine of growth in the company by you know teaming up with the other C-suite people in the company, you know, being a growth hacker, like the Rodan and Fields example that I gave in terms of, you know, disrupting your own business, finding out new business models, but equally connecting business and purpose. That's what we as, as a marketing organization are, are uniquely placed to do that, as well as then personalization. And I would say, cultivating the unicorns i think those are probably in my mind the unicorns i mean like the tech people like all of the data bits that i you need to be friends with those people and have them in your team and cultivate them and through those things i think you can truly become a growth engine but it's no longer being the pretty pictures department you know the madman days are over <laughs> <laughs> well christoph thank you so much for coming on the show it's been uh, been fascinating conversation oh, you're welcome my pleasure thank you hi it's alan again Marketing Today was created and produced by me. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners, and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart. This is Marketing Today.